I just want to do God's will. The kind of revolution that the world needs is a Christian revolution. If you want a miracle, you've got to expect it to happen. You are the recipients of God's grace and God's blessings, and you rejoice in that reality. Welcome to Life Today Live. I'm Randy Robison, and uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation today. We're going to get real. We're not going to hide things. We're going to uh, put things into the light and be honest. My guest is Tully and Trevigian, and if you recognize that name, it's because, you know, 10 a little over 10 years ago, um, he was on sort of the, the rising, the fast track. Uh, his books were selling lots of books, blessing lots of people. He's a very gifted teacher, uh, speaker, and author. Uh, and then things sort of fell apart. And uh, you're going to find out where he's been, uh, what God's done in his life. And out of it, what I want you to see is that we have a God of redemption and hope. Um, even when we mess things up and we do sometimes Tully and I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being willing to talk. Thanks for having me on Randy. I was saying before we went live that the last time you and I saw each other was I think 2011, 2012. Uh, we had a conversation about a book that I had recently published. Uh, and I remember that conversation fondly. So thanks for having me back on. Oh, great to have you. And yeah, I mean, it was one of those things where I I thought you were obviously great at expressing yourself, expressing God's truth. And then, you know, you hear what what's going on and it's like, man, it's one of those, it, it, it hurts my heart. You know, mm. uh, I, I, I hate that. I hate that we as humans fail. Uh, mm. I hate what it does to other people, especially people whose faith may not be strong. Uh, mm. what it does to your family, what it does to you. It's just, it's tough. Walk us through mm. a little bit of some of that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how much about me your listeners uh, know, but yeah, I mean, I was born into Christian royalty. Um, yeah. my, my mom is the oldest daughter of Billy and Ruth Graham. So I grew up with Billy and Ruth Graham as my grandparents. We called them daddy bill and Tete. Mm. uh, remarkable upbringing, middle of seven kids, my mom and dad were remarkable parents. I'm incredibly grateful for my upbringing and all that went along with it. Um, and I dropped out of high school at 16 and got kicked out of my house at 16. And um, I was the black sheep of the family, went my own way, grew up in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale area, where there's plenty to do. Uh, if you don't have any teachers looking over your shoulders or parents breathing down your neck, there's plenty to do and plenty of trouble to get into. And I did. Uh, and then that season came to an end for me when I was about 21 years old. Um, and it wasn't one particular event or one particular thing. It was just this culminating sense of there's got to be more to life than what I'm experiencing. And I knew where home was, um, metaphorically speaking, spiritually speaking. And so my relationship with God really became real at that point in my life. Went on to college, got, I got married first, went on to college, went on to seminary. Um, had three kids, uh, served on the staff of a large church in Knoxville for two years, and then moved back home to South Florida to plant a church at the request of a group of people. Um, and that church, when it was about five years old, merged with the historic Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, which was a very well-known, famous church at the time. Um, and I became then the pastor of Coral Ridge, uh, absorbing the church that I had planted. And uh, the first 18 months or so were really, really difficult. Um, and then God just sort of blew everything up in a good way. Uh, Coral Ridge became alive again. It had been an aging, dying church for a while, and it became alive again. Uh, my life personally and professionally was really taking off. As you mentioned, I was writing a book a year. A handful of those books became bestsellers, award-winning books. Um, I was pastoring a flagship church in our country. I was traveling around the country, um, speaking at different conferences, colleges, seminaries, churches, you name it. Some of the most well-known churches in the country I had the privilege of preaching from, the pulpit there. Um, and, uh, and then in 2015, everything came crashing down. Uh, so eight years ago, right about eight years ago now, um, my two things I thought would be with me forever was my 
uh, role and calling as the pastor at Coral Ridge and my 21 year marriage uh, to the girl I had married when I was 21 years old. And both came crashing down in 2015 um, because I was unfaithful to my first wife. Um, and, uh, and it was because I was a public person, all of this played out very publicly. Uh, my first marriage ended in divorce uh, about six to eight months later because of that. Uh, and during that time, so I lost my first marriage. Um, I lost my family unit as I knew it. Now my kids, they're all grown up, um, but they never blinked. I mean, they were incredibly gracious. I wrote a book called One Way Love, but they were the ones who gave One Way Love. Um, our relationship never disconnected, thank God. Um, but my family unit, as I had known it, Christmases, birthdays, you know, all the things that we typically do as a nuclear family, all of that was gone now forever. Um, friendships gone, job gone, credibility gone, financial security gone. I mean, all of those things, life as I knew it and life as I loved it uh, came crashing down and came to a screeching halt. So I was at the time 42, I'm 50 now. I was 42 um, and about to turn 43 when all this happened. And, uh, and you know, I, I don't think we realize what it is we depend on to make life worth living until it's gone. And I discovered at 42 years old that I had been depending on a lot of things, my accomplishments, my reputation, the people in my life, a lot of things smaller than God and his love for me to define me, uh, to forge my identity. And so when I lost all that other stuff, the people, the places, and the things that um, had defined me for so long. I, I underwent a massive identity crisis. I spent the next couple of years uh, really struggling to know who I am, what had happened, what I had become, why every why everything that happened happened. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, with some great therapists, counselors, friends, uh, my kids, my wife, Stacy, um, who I married in August of 2016, uh, her family, uh, there were handfuls of people, uh, small pockets of people that God used to really kind of slowly nurse me back to health, a couple of pastors. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I look back now and there are some days to be honest with you, Randy, it feels like that was five lifetimes ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, it seems so long ago. And then there are other times where it feels like it was five minutes ago. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't, people oftentimes ask me, well, how do you get from where you were to where you are? I mean, you crash, you burn, you bottom out, uh, you lose your life, uh, in a sense. Uh, and now it seems like, you know, you're sort of back on track. How did you get from there to here? And honestly, man, I don't know what to say. I, there's not a formula to follow. There's, I'm grateful for the people God put in my life. But at the end of the day, I'm just grateful for God never leaving me or forsaking me. I am alive today, not because in my darkest moments I held on to God, but because in my darkest moments God held on to me even when I let go. And so it is, I have come to a much deeper appreciation of his goodness, his faithfulness, uh, his grace, his outrageous mercy, which has breathed new life into me. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the summarized version <laughs> yeah. of 50 years of my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's a lot there. I, I need to ask you about a few important things. Uh, sure. Number one, responsibility mm. uh taking responsibility for your own actions how how, mm. how hard was that did you try mm. to make excuses at first or did you oh yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah when it all you know um i did not respond well in crisis when when everything went public i was in survival mode i was in self-salvation mode i was doing everything i could to spin the narrative um, minimize my own culpability, uh, tell enough truth about myself to convince people I was telling the whole truth, but in reality, I really wasn't telling the whole truth. Um, feigning repentance, feigning sorrow. Now, I really was sorry for the pain I caused my wife at the time, for the pain that I caused um, my children, especially at the time. 
uh, and other people, uh, but my wife and children predominantly. Um, but at the same time, I was feeling very sorry for myself. Um, there were a handful of things that went on during that season. Um, my infidelity was one of those things, but there were other things that were going on that gave me the unjustified opportunity to shift blame. I could look at that person, what that person did or how that person failed to be my friend or whatever. And I could justify, rationalize things. So yeah, I spent a lot of time and it wasn't until all of my efforts to justify myself eventually fell flat. God graciously uh, wrecked me against wall after wall after wall. And it wasn't until then that I realized this is such a waste of time. Just die already. Really. I mean, you know, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, just, just die to these efforts of trying to salvage yourself and save yourself. And, um, and so it took, I would say, to be honest with you, it took a solid year. So all of this, this story went public in June of 2015, Uh, It all started to fall apart in spring and early summer of 2015. um, And it went public in 2015, June 2015. And it wasn't until probably mid-August 2016. So a full year where I had been, I had spent an entire year trying to salvage everything I had lost professionally, salvage everything I had lost personally and manipulating as best as I could to try to get my old life back. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of that, thankfully, God didn't allow to happen. So it was a full year of running, was, running. Was, was that exhausting? Exhausting, exhausting. <laughs> I didn't realize it necessarily at the time, but I look back now and I just think, man, I mean, I was running on this treadmill as fast as I could, going nowhere, doing everything I could in my own yeah, power yeah. and according to my own wisdom, which is foolishness essentially, um, to try to fix things and and save myself and and save the life that I had lost and it was just a fool's errand it was a fool's errand yeah so what was there a moment or was it just kind of a process that you just kind of gave up in a sense in in, in a in a healthy way yeah sure in a healthy way yeah um it was more of a process than a moment i mean it was it was made up of a bunch of moments i have in my mind a handful of different episodes um where i think were strategic uh, in God's economy to get me to the place of realizing my own personal powerlessness. Uh, um, but yeah, I uh, it was really a process. I the, I, I mentioned that um, my wife Stacy. We've been married for almost seven years, six and a half years. It'll be seven years in August. We got married August of 2016. And uh, that first year we were married because she's from Texas. We lived in Texas. Now I'm not from Texas. I'm from South Florida. Fort Lauderdale is my home. It's, it's the place that I love. It's um, you know, it's, it's poetry to me. South Florida is. And so I'm now living about an hour at the time in 2016 and early 2017, living about an hour North of Houston in a little town called Willis population, 6,000 people. Um, nobody really knows where that is or what that is, but there I was living in a rented house with my new wife in Willis, Texas. Um, I spent most of my days alone because Stacy would go to work. She was working for a title company in the woodlands at the time. So she would go to work. Um, and you know, I was sort of at home, you know, doing the domestic duties, um, and going to the gym once a day and going to counseling twice a week. That was my life. (laughs) A lot of time spent alone, um, And it was very, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be with my wife, but I didn't want to be in Texas. I didn't want to be as far away from everything familiar as I was. But it was very strategic on God's part to get me away from everything familiar, which forced me to be weaned off of everything that had previously defined me or things that I thought previously defined me. Um, And to sort of, uh, for lack of a better phrase, put me to death. I mean, he, it was like a forced sabbatical. It was a, it was a wilderness experience for me and it was absolutely painful and absolutely necessary. Mm. Um, and, uh, it, the, the ways in which God deconstructed me and the, the people that he used, uh, and the sort of the, the tactics that he employed were so unconventional in so many ways, so unpredictable. I was writing recently that, you know, when when uh, Christian leaders crash and burn, depending on 
what tradition they're a part of, what church tradition they're a part of. There's usually a process that is in place for discipline and restoration and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I was never in my denomination, the denomination that I was a part of uh, stripped me of my credentials. And that was my discipline. They just sort of washed their hands of me and defrocked me. So I was, in a sense, on my own. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there isn't a process that any church or theological tradition could put in place that was more effective than the one God established for me during that time, because it was <laughs> nothing I would have chosen for myself. Yeah, yeah. It was harder, yeah. longer uh, than any of the other processes that I could have gone through had I been offered a process like that. And and two, you know, when a church or a denomination puts you through a process like that, at least I can only speak to what I would have done at the time, because I was so desperate to get my old life back, I would have jumped through whatever hoops they would have prescribed and not for the right reasons. I would have done it just because I wanted to get my stuff back, my life back, yeah. um, my reputation back. But this discipline slash restoration process that God took me on uh, in some little town in Willis, Texas, surrounded by some strategic people was was very difficult, but necessary. And I, I look back now and thank him for every minute of it. Hmm. You, uh, you, you went to seminary, so you, you're ahead of me in that one. You've preached from the pulpit <clears throat> for years. But you know that the idea of repentance in Scripture is not just, I'm sorry, especially I'm sorry I got caught, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But even it's not just I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's actually a, a transformation of the mind. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a changing of direction. Um, what did you learn about repentance mm. that, that maybe you had— spoke enough thought of kind of knew in your head but now you had to live out and it becomes really real at that point yeah well i've learned a handful of things the first thing i learned is if we we are very capable of faking repentance mm -hmm. very capable every human being is capable of feigning faking repentance real repentance is wrought in our hearts and minds by god mm -hmm. that's when you know it's real that's when you know like you you, you wake up one day and you you uh, are aware of things that you were previously unaware of. I'll give you an example. And, and let me say this too, Martin Luther, who is my historical hero, not Martin Luther King Jr., who was also an amazing man, but Martin Luther, the reformer from the 1500s, uh, he wrote that all of life is repentance. And uh, I'm not sure I fully understood what he meant then like I do now. Um, I remember sitting, for instance, uh, my my oldest son, Gabe, came to live with my wife, Stacy, and I in Texas for six months. He was going through a difficult season in life, and so he moved from Florida to, to Texas, moved in with us. And it was a great six months for he and I because it gave us time to process everything that had happened a year before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it affected him probably the most because he and I are so close, and he was the oldest um, and so we were sitting on uh, our front porch one night of the house that we were renting, uh, just Gabe and me. And he said, you know, dad, we were having a conversation about all this stuff. And he said, you know, dad, I know that you're sorry for what you've done. I mean, you've made that very clear. You've made that you've you've apologized to mom. Uh, you've apologized to, to me and my brother and my sister. I mean, you've you've made that clear and, it, and it's obvious. Um, but the one thing that you haven't apologized for you've apologized to us for what you did to hurt us, but you didn't apologize to us for what you did to hurt someone we love, namely mom. Mm. Well, that was eye opening to me because I thought I didn't not say sorry for that because I didn't want to. I was completely unaware of that. Like it didn't even dawn on me that I not only need to apologize to my kids for hurting them, I need to apologize to my kids for hurting someone they love, yeah. namely their mother. Yeah. Um, and in that moment, I remember I just broke down and I said, son, you're you're right. And it, that was a new level of repentance for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think when Martin Luther says all of life is repentance, it's we never we never outgrow our need to become increasingly aware of what we need to repent of. <laughs> um, God is thankfully he doesn't show us all at the same time what we right. need to repent of. It would be overwhelming. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he's gracious enough to space it out to where. Um, you know, when when he does sort of open our eyes afresh to a new area that needs to be confessed and repented of, owned up to, um, and then gives you the grace to do that. So 
Yeah, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm still learning that repentance uh, is a process, um, you know, that uh, all of life is repentance. And so I like I said, I, I know that we are very capable of faking it, feigning it, pretending we're sorry when we're really not. Mm. But when God does his work on us by gracing us with the with the gift of repentance, that's when you know it's real and you really you feel it in your heart and you know it. And then you're able to look at your life and go, it's I'm moving in a completely different direction than I was moving before. And that's credit to God, not credit to me. We're talking to Tully and Chavijan, having the hard conversation uh, in order, not, not just, I, I, I really want to be clear that I'm not doing this to kind of go, Oh, you know, look at this well-known guy who fell. And I, I don't want this to be, gossipy prurient what what i hope comes through is is, is hope uh for redemption mm. no matter how bad you messed up we've all messed up mm. uh, it's just some of us some not us but some people get thrown out of their job and lose their marriage over their mistakes their when their sin uh mm. and, and to recover from that is is a work of god it is the mission of god i mean his will is, is conformity to Christ in our lives, and that never stops. No matter how many times we mess up, he still mm. wants to conform us to Christ. So that's, that's what I want you to hear. I want to show you a website. This is fallenandfree.com. Is that right? Did I get the right URL? Fallenandfree.com. Yeah, which takes you to the, the Sanctuary Church website. And this is a conference coming up at the end of the month in Jupiter, or in February, rather, uh, later in February. And, and hopefully we'll see some of those uh, messages uh, online eventually on the website. But... My, I want to show you this because God can restore mm. our mistakes. There, there is redemption, and I know Tullian, you still get, you still get all the questions. Should you be back in ministry? You are pastoring mm -hmm. down there at a small church in, in Jupiter, Florida. Should you be married to another woman? You know, I mean, mm. what what do you, what do, what do you do when? not just when you get these questions, but when you ask them even of yourself, because you got to hear from God before you can have peace to be remarried or to be ministering again. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we disqualify ourselves, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's God who qualifies us in the first place. So I would never sit here and say, oh, well, you've done this, therefore you can never again. That's not, sure. that's not biblical. At the same mm -hmm. time, you know, you and I both seen, man, um, we, you see guys rush back in the pulpit and you're like, dude, you, you need, you got some, God's got some work to do on you before you should be. Yeah. Done. Where, where do, how do you deal with those? Yeah, man. I wrestled with all those things. You know, I, I wrestled a lot. I'm, I am back in a sense doing what I was originally called to do, but I was dragged back into it, kicking and screaming by God. This is not something I wanted to do. Hmm. Um, and yet at the same time, I'm very, very glad that he has uh, recommissioned me in this new way uh, here in Jupiter. But yeah, I mean, I spent a long time, man. Um, a, a lot of my time spent in therapy was wrestling with those questions. Yeah. Um, I was remarried. Uh, was was I allowed to be remarried? I mean, wrestling with those issues biblically, wrestling with those issues just experientially, wrestling with those issues relationally, because now it's a blended family. What does that feel like to Stacy's kids? What does that feel like to my kids? How does that affect their lives? Yeah, um, yeah. So there were a lot of those issues. And, you know, there's really no one size fits all. We know what the Bible says about certain things that are very clear. Uh, I think you're right in those passages, for instance, in Timothy and Titus that people typically go to to say, well, here are the qualifications for elders, overseers, mm -hmm. church leaders. Um, and if you if you screw up here, then you're out. Uh, and yet you can't find anywhere in those passages uh, exegetically or even if you look back on it historically that any failure to meet those qualifications at any point in your life therefore disqualifies you forever a band for life kind of thing you just can't find that there there are i think those qualifications are there to say if the person you're looking at to be in leadership is in a season of life where they're failing on these fronts this isn't the right time for them okay. give god a give god space to work on this person break this person down put this person to death 
raise this person to newness of life. And when that happens, they'll be more ready to do what God wants them to do than they are now. Yeah. So, so that was, you know, for me, I think uh, I was sharing this with you uh, before we went on air, but I, um, you know, I tried, I really tried that first year. <laughs> I really tried to sort of um, manufacture uh, all of the things that I felt needed to be manufactured in order for me to get my life back. Um, and I was trying too hard, too quickly to get back uh, because I didn't know who I was without all those things and without that stuff, without that calling. And, and the, the fact that God did not allow that to happen is uh, felt very mean of him at the time. But I look back now and I'm thinking, gosh, he was being so gracious to me because in reality, what he was doing by not allowing me to re-secure those things that I had found security in was he was sort of uh, forcing me. He was kicking me into a new freedom from false definitions of who I was. Hmm. And saying, no, it's I'm going to take you away and I'm going to take you away for as long as it takes until you can finally find your identity, your worth, your value, your significance and in your security in me and my love for you and not all of these other transient things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a relationship or a job or a, a book or a whatever responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I, I'm very, very grateful that he was as attentive to me as he was by not allowing me to succeed in all of my efforts <laughs> to try to get my old life back. So I tried. Uh, it wasn't that, you know, I, I didn't try like some guys try and I didn't. No, I tried too. I just failed. Um, and on as a result of failing in that first year, uh, that's when that's when I was finally tired enough um, to go, OK, God, whatever you need to do, whatever surgical procedure you need to do and however long it takes do it because i'm i'm i've i've reached the end of my resources yeah. uh i've come to the end of myself and um and so i think for each person it's a very it's it's god uh custom makes tailor makes these processes for each person um and yeah i i for me i'm, I'm it was a weird <laughs> unconventional process uh, that I went through uh, under God's hand, but I'm grateful for it. Uh, I've got a really good question from the audience I'm going to ask you, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, what did you do all these years for a job? Do, were you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so thankfully, and uh, I hesitate to share this because it sounds, because I know a lot of people who don't have this luxury, um, but because I, 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 had, I, I, was financially secure when all this happened. So I was able to go, you know, I don't know, a year, two years, something like that without having to work. Now I did, mm -hmm. and I did some consulting work behind the scenes stuff um, with some different people that paid me a little here and a little there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that was sort of, that was going on for the first two years maybe. Um, and then uh, in, Gosh, early 2018, late 2017, early 2018, uh, I had started writing again and telling my story as honestly and transparently as I knew how, putting it up on my website. Um, and as a result, I started getting invitations to speak. Mm. Um, and that next 18 months for me, so end of 2017 to like the middle of 2019 or so, um, I mean, my wife, Stacy, and I went everywhere i mean we and this was the first time in my life that i had to accept every speaking invitation that came because it paid the bills right. so the so it took me and god knew what he was doing by putting me in that position because it took me everywhere i mean i was at a small arp church associate reformed presbyterian church that met in a middle school uh, middle school cafeteria one Sunday to a 5,000 person African American church in Atlanta the next Sunday mm -hmm. to a Pentecostal church over here to this uh, sort of a free grace conference over here. I mean, it was all over the map, man. Um, and it was a great experience. I think it, it opened my eyes to the fact that God's kingdom 
uh, is a lot bigger and God's family is a lot more diverse than what I had yeah. realized. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, you might be proud of me as, as a raised Southern Baptist or Roberts university graduate. Uh, I last year, uh, joined a Cumberland Presbyterian church. Did you really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Look at you. <laughs> See, you're very well-rounded. <laughs> I'm a Presbyterian now and, and it might even get more interesting based on some conversations yesterday. Anyway, here's, here's, here's a question. Uh, and this is a really great question. Um, when you accept responsibility for your actions or you've messed up, you've, you've broken the vows of your marriage, you have hurt your children, you've hurt your church, you have failed. I mean, it, it, that's, that's pretty big. And, and I know that big. accepting responsibility for that is the first step to even being in a position where God can have his way in your life again. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know what follows right on the heels of that, which is an accuser, uh, mm -hmm. a voice that says that you have failed so much that God can't use you anymore. Did you have to learn to forgive yourself in this? Mm. So I'm not a huge fan of that phrase only because the forgiveness that we need, <laughs> the only forgiveness that we need, ultimately, ultimately speaking, is God's. And so I think sometimes when we talk about forgiving ourselves, what, what I've discovered in my own process through working through that is it's more about becoming, it's more about actually believing that God has forgiven me. And when I believe God, my, in other words, my, when I say I need to forgive myself, what I'm really saying is I need to believe more and more that God has actually forgiven me. That's my real struggle. The real struggle is I know God says he forgives me. I know the Bible says that God forgives us 70 times seven, that we can never out -sin the coverage of God's forgiveness. But man, I've screwed up so bad. And there are people in my life that I love who are walking away from me. It only makes sense that God would walk away from me too. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's the that was the real issue for me. The real issue for me was, yes, I wanted to secure the forgiveness of people in my life who I had hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and in most cases where it mattered, my kids, my now ex-wife and other people like that, all of those things have been worked out. Forgiveness has been granted back and forth. Um, but at the time, it was a bit of a struggle. Um, and I, I hated that. And as much as I wanted to secure that, my deepest struggle was because my life was falling apart, it started to feel like God had left the building. Mm. That's what it started to feel like. It's in my, in my darkest moments, it started to feel like God has bailed. Um, you know, God, just like everybody else, you know, I say this all the time that you never know. It's almost impossible to know who your real friends are when you're at the top, when you have so much to offer. But when you're That's at the true. bottom, that is true. when you're at the bottom and you have nothing to offer but liability and leprosy to people, <laughs> that's when you discover pretty quickly who your friends are. And uh, and a lot of people left. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, I thought I had a lot more friends than I did. But the fact that God never left the building, um, you know, so I, I think that was that was the bigger struggle. That, that that was the battle that I was having to work through more so than forgiving myself or even securing the forgiveness of other people. It was believing that I actually am forgiven by God. And I, I have this, um, you may have seen it the last time I was with you. I have this uh, a tattoo down my right arm uh, that has the words of a hymn to it, my favorite hymn. And it says this, well, may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them well and thousands more. My God, he knoweth none, mm. which is this idea that God casts our sea. I mean, God casts our sin um, or our sin is cast into the sea of God's forgotten memory that he takes our sin and removes it as far as the east is from the west. And, you know, believing and it's not that God can't remember our sins. Of course he can. He's omniscient. It's that he chooses not to remember them. He mm. chooses not to hold our sins against us because ultimately our sins were held against Christ. And that's, um, that has, I believed that theologically before I right. crashed and burned in 2015, but I believe it in my heart now in a way that I only believed it in my head before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's a hard process, but it's a good process um, mm -hmm. when, when God works that 
into your soul, the very fiber yes. of your being. Yeah. Uh, if, if any of you guys are watching and you, you want to go read a little bit more, I want to point you to Tullian's website. Uh, it is Tullian.net, T-U-L-L-I-A-N.net, for those of you listening on the podcast side. Uh, and you'll see the uh, article right there being kicked into freedom. Uh, and that really, he, he lays it out raw. And that's part of the reason I knew that I could ask some really tough questions because mm-hmm. he's already addressed these things uh, <laughs> and, and they're, they're right there. But tell you, I, I want to give you the last word. You can say obviously anything you want, but what I, I hope that someone who has experienced what you've experienced in the way of feeling like God has left the building because I messed up. My, my sin is so much that God can't stand to be around me. I am done. I am ruined. I, I want that person to, to hear some hope from someone who is live, living it and has mm. been where they've been. What do you say to that person that thinks that God can't forgive me? People shouldn't forgive me. God can't mm-hmm. forgive me. I, I know he says he can, but I don't know. I'm done. I'm ruined. What do you say to them? Man, I have those conversations on a weekly basis with people, really, Um, because I'm so out there with my own story. I get letters from not only face to face conversations from uh, with people, but also letters from people I'll never meet uh, who ask that same exact question. And, you know, the only thing that I'm able to say to people who come to me hopeless like that, who come to me fearing that their best days are behind them, that they've screwed up so bad that it's hard for them to believe that anybody, including God, could ever love them. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I can say to people like that, th- because i that's the way I felt, and there were very few things people could say to me that would sort of snap me out of that way of thinking. I, I just had to go through it. God, in time, had to just prove that he was, in fact, faithful, mm-hmm. even in the face of my faithlessness, that he was gracious, even in the face of my guilt. Um, and so I would just say to those people who are experiencing that or feeling that right now, and I don't want this to sound cliche, but I would say, matter of factly, God has you. He has you. It may not feel like he has you. It may feel like he has left the building, that he has left you, forsaken you, abandoned you. It may feel like your best days are behind you, that your life is over. And all I can say is, God knows exactly how to get you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And he knows the process that you need to go through specifically. He knows what you have to experience in order to be awakened Mm. to new dimensions of his love and his grace and his mercy. And sometimes it's going to feel like God has turned the lights off and he's not turning them back on. But oftentimes I've discovered he turns all the lights off and remains quiet so that when he shows up, you know, again, we see him in a way that we couldn't see him before. And I I can tell you this, that I'm now, you know, a year's removed from all of that, uh, from the the trauma itself, um, that event itself, the traumatic event itself. But uh, I am I am still learning. Uh, how good God is in the face of our badness, our failure, our guilt, our shame, our regret, our loss. I mean, his tenderness has been revealed to me in a way that I only understood theologically before. I mean, it is profound. I am a different guy now. And I'm not a different guy now because I've worked hard at being a different guy or I read a book called How to Be a Different Guy. I mean, I'm not, I'm a different guy now because God has come into my life and has wrecked me afresh and has put me to death and has breathed new life into me. And I'm just, um, I couldn't be more grateful to him. And I had people telling me this when I was in the middle of it and experiencing the worst of it. I had people saying this stuff to me. And to be honest with you, to be honest with you, it made me mad. I'm like, stop giving me your Christian cliches, dude. You can say God is good all you want. I mean, there were times, Randy, where I would sit in church and I was furious during the singing portion of a worship service after all this happened, because I didn't believe any of this to be true. (laughs) That speaking of God being a good father, he's not a good father. He left me months ago. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So I understand what it feels like to be angry with God, disappointed with God, frustrated with God, um, wanting to give God a piece of our mind because life is much harder than it ought to be. And Mm -hmm. our punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. And I I mean, I wrestle with all that stuff. Um, And God just sort of persistently, patiently and graciously sort of worked me through all of that stuff. Um, so, um, whoever's listening, your life is not over. If you're not dead, God's not done. Um, and whatever God's doing as painful as it may seem right now is ultimately going to turn out for your good. You will be freer on the other side of this than you ever were before. And you'll be more content on the other side of this than you ever were before. Mm -hmm. At least that's been true for me. I hear that. Hear that. Somebody needed to hear that. Mm. So hear those last words. Tully, man, uh, thank you for being so raw and real and uh, continuing to walk through it. Don't don't ever stop, mm. brother. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Randy. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate all you guys out there watching. Check out the website, Tullian.net. Tullian.net. And if you want to get in touch with him, maybe have a Tullian come speak to your church. He, I don't know if he's still ex- ex- accepting every invitation that comes. <laughs> no, way. I can't because I have a church to pastor now. But, <laughs> he's um, pastoring a church now, but, no. but he might come. But, um, but do check that out. Uh, and if you need to check out the Fallen and Free Conference, uh, you can do that at fallenandfreeconference.com, especially if you're down there in the Jupiter, Florida area. This may be the lifeline you've been waiting on, so grab onto it. Uh, but appreciate you guys out there. If you know someone who's struggling, hit share. And as always, we appreciate it when you like, subscribe, follow, and come back. We've got more for you right here on Life Today Live. I'll see you again next time. Same for you, the same for every man, human, Gentile, and feminine. Whether they believe it or not. We float on this vast, limitless sea of divine mercy.